Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the Garrison Institute Forum Series on Pathways to Planetary Health. I'm Jonathan Rose, the co-founder of the Garrison Institute, and it is my great pleasure to host this conversation with Sam Myers. Sam Myers, who's a, both an MD and an MPH, studies human health impacts and their accelerating disruptions to Earth's natural systems, a field that is dubbed planetary health. So it's not only their disruptions to Earth's natural systems, but how those affect human health. He's a principal research scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and is the founding director of the Planetary Health Alliance. He received his B.A. from Harvard College, his M.D. from Yale University School of Medicine, and M.P.H. from the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. Um, Sam is the co-editor with Howard Frumpkin of Planetary Health, Protecting Nature to Protect Ourselves. It's an amazing book, um, which I highly recommend that you get. Um, you can see in the chat section, there's uh, information on how to get it. And it has uh, chapter by chapter, it really leads you through all the major issue areas uh, in beautiful overview and detail. Before we begin today's conversation, I just want to go over a few logistical items. We're on a Zoom webinar, so participant audio and video are off. We reserve time for questions, so please post your questions in the Q&A panel. We're on for an hour today, and we'll start the questions about 45 minutes into the conversation, and we will respond to as many questions as we can. A recording of this conversation will be made available on the Garrison Institute website. And if you like it, I encourage you to share it. All right, let's get started. Sam, welcome to Pathways to Planetary Health Forum. Thank you, Jonathan. It's so nice to be here. Um, so you told me that growing up in New England, you began your connection to the natural world. Um, so tell me, how did talk, talk a little bit about that and how it actually led you to go to medical school? Yeah, well, what it really led to was sort of a lifelong confusion because it <laughs> it it um, it led to a real, um, I think, sort of emotional and spiritual connection to being outdoors and in nature, despite growing up as a city kid in Boston. But we spent a lot of time in the White Mountains and. Um, sort of roaming around uh, outside in Cape Cod. And um, I I just, I loved being outdoors. Um, and I felt it was something that you know, we might call reverence or, you know, there, there was a sort of emotional, spiritual connection to being outside, even as a little kid. And um, when I was in college, I started to get super fascinated with people and uh, the human body and, uh, medicine and mental health and um, from an intellectual standpoint um, medicine was extremely appealing um, but the confusion was sort of how to connect that intellectual fascination with um, engaging with the complexity of you know the the, the human body and trying to be a healer um, how to connect that with um, my deep connection to the natural world and sort of beginning to wonder the more I learned about what was happening to the natural world, um, how we could be sort of dismantling um, nature without ultimately paying consequences. And so I started to kind of muse about that um, back in college and um, trying to figure out whether I wanted to be a, a wildlife veterinarian or a field biologist or a physician and ultimately um, decided to try to try to do it from the medical side and then make the connections. Um, but there you were finishing medical school and somehow you ended up in Tibet. Yeah, well, so, um, so I went to medical school at Yale and one of the reasons I was excited about Yale was because they had a very strong school of forestry and environmental science. and. When I was in medical school, I spent an awful lot of my time, maybe too much of my time, up at the School of Forestry and Environmental Science and um, really made a lot of friends there. And then when I went off to residency at University of California in San Francisco, um, one of the people that I'd gotten to know invited me out to dinner. 
uh, with a delegation of Tibetans who were visiting the United States Western sort of park system to learn a little bit about how we manage big parks because they were about to create a gigantic park on the north side of Mount Everest called the Chomolongma Nature Preserve. And um, at this dinner, I was seated next to uh, the person who turned out to be the health minister for the Tibet, for the Tibet Autonomous Region, as it was called. And um, she asked me if I would come over and run a project that was focused on uh, primary health care and environmental conservation and public health. And um, I told her that I was totally unqualified and uneducated to do something mm -hmm. like that three times. And I warned her if she asked me again, I would say yes. And she asked me again and I said yes. So then I, I had to leave my residency um, after my second year and go to uh, live um, up in a little tiny town called Tingri, which was uh, sort of halfway between the capital and the Sino-Nepalese border. Um, and uh, where I managed this integrated conservation development project for, for two years before finishing my residency. And it just happens I've been to Tingri and it is a pretty desolate place. And it is pretty, there aren't a lot of health services there. So uh, that must have been amazing, but it's an awesomely impressive landscape too. Um, so let's talk about this integration of environment and health because uh, we're beginning to see, we meaning the larger cultures, beginning to see their interconnection more. But for quite some time, uh, people didn't. They were really in separate boxes. Um, uh, so describe now, because in many ways, your pathway as the leader of the Planetary Health Alliance has, your personal pathway has been the pathway of the formation really of this field. Well, I think that, um, I mean, for one, we, we stand on the shoulders of others. And so there um, have been other formulations to try to connect um, human health, uh, animal health, environment um, that have come before planetary health. And um, there's been a field of conservation medicine, uh, eco health, of one health. Um, they've all had sort of different perspectives. They've come from different practitioners, sort of communities of practitioners. Um, but I think what's really led to the emergence of planetary health um, so recently, really only over the last uh, five years, um, have been sort of scale and urgency. And the, the scale is the sort of scale of human impacts on our planet's natural system. Right. So if you look at curves of you know, human consumption patterns globally or uh, you know, related curves of our impacts on our natural systems, whether you're looking at biodiversity or global pollution or addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere or appropriation of fresh water resources, you, know, you name it, they all look very similar and they all have this sort of very, very um, steep, almost exponential acceleration in the last several decades. And so just the, the scale of human impacts across our natural systems has is a relatively new phenomenon and it's been ballooning at really an extraordinary pace. And so there's a, there is a um, way in which our transformation of our natural systems, of the climate system, of biodiversity loss, land use change, global pollution, changes in biogeochemical cycles, resource scarcity of things like freshwater and arable land, all of those things are interacting with each other in very complex ways to affect the core conditions of human health. And that's a relatively new phenomenon. And the extent to which that transformation of natural systems is threatening to drive the majority of the global burden of disease of all the mm. illness and death that all people experience everywhere, um, that's a relatively new phenomenon. And so while other fields had been interested from an almost sort of intellectual and curiosity driven standpoint at connections between say animal health and zoonotic diseases that might affect people, um, uh, or El Nino and outbreaks of hantavirus that are sort of fascinating as ecological examples. Um, mm. Now, I think uh, there's a need for the entire global public health community, um, regardless of their interest in environmental science per se, to 
uh, grapple with uh, our transformation of natural systems as a prime driver of burden of disease. And I think that's really kind of what's given the thrust behind uh, the emergence of, the, of planetary health as a concept. So one of the things you did in response was form the Planetary Health Alliance, which is an organization of more than 100 organizations. It's a network because, number one, it's a global problem, so it's dispersed. Number two, it's across many, many disciplines, so it has an equal disbursement. So you've been pulling these pieces together into a coherent whole. Um, so just talk about what some of the, so obviously climate change is one of the pieces and biodiversity losses is another pieces and public health infrastructure is another piece. Talk about what are some of the pieces that you see that, that uh, or maybe the, the clusters that, that you see in the Health Alliance, Planetary Health Alliance. Right, well, so um, in 2014, the Rockefeller Foundation created a um, commission with help from The Lancet, which is sort of the preeminent global health journal based in London. Right. And um, they ended up creating the Rockefeller Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, which uh, spent a year uh, formulating a report to sort of lay out what we saw as the major global health risks associated with these kinds of environmental change. And I knew that we were publishing this report in July of 2015, and I was a little concerned that we'd be sort of raising the alarm and saying we're in real trouble with respect to human health and environmental change, but we wouldn't be providing much in the way of what do we do about it. And so I, at that time, had proposed to the Rockefeller Foundation that we create an alliance that would bring together this sort of nascent community around the world that was trying to grow a field of planetary health. And so we started that in 2016. And as you say, we, we've grown very rapidly. In fact, there are over 200 organizations now uh, from over 40 countries in the alliance. And, and you're right, they come from academia, from government agencies, the nonprofit sector, um, and uh, they come from the environmental sciences and conservation fields, as well as public health. Um, and in a way, I mean, the core premise of planetary health, right, is that uh, the scale of our impacts on natural systems, you know, it, it exceeds our planet's capacity to, to absorb our ways, to provide the resources that we're using sustainably, and that's leading to this transformation of natural systems, which is imperiling our health and well-being. And so when you think about well, what do you do about that, um, what you need to do is kind of do everything differently as a global <laughs> society. And so that means changing food systems and changing our built environment and our energy systems and how we manufacture goods and things like economic theory and even, even the stories that we tell ourselves about our relationship to the natural world. And so that's why planetary health brings together such an extraordinary diverse community of practitioners. We need our artists and our storytellers. We need our faith leaders. We need indigenous voices just as much as we need, you know, experts in energy systems and food systems and architects and urban planners. And, um, you know, every community actually has something to bring to what we call the great transition or, or the need to sort of change how we live uh, on Earth in order to address these problems. And so that's why it's such a broad tent and such a broad community. So one of the pieces that needs to change, you mentioned economics, is that we have an economic system that currently rewards maximizing the potential of the individual at the cost of the common good. So the more profit one can make by ignoring the externalities, by ignoring the impacts on water and air and human resources and even vast, you know, death that can come from pollution. Um, those are those are ignored costs in this system. So um, the and eco, the in a funny way, the economics are simply a reflection of the value system of our society. Um, and so if we're really going to change the economic system, and there are a lot of technical ways to do this, um, it means that we have to uh, move the, reshift the balance between the primacy of the individual and the prim primacy of the commons. So tell me about your thoughts about, about uh, 
instead of taking from the common good, restoring the common good? Well, I think you're right. And I think we're only just starting to kind of unpack the extent to which the, the problems that we confront in planetary health are a reflection of a broad way of looking at the world and, and how we organize ourselves. And I think um, that's true actually of our kind of um, very tardy awakening to um, the deep systemic issues of racism in our country that I think are also in some ways connected to um, the issues we face in planetary health. Um, and I think that um, the idea of every individual kind of wanting to get theirs um, mm -hmm. as opposed to support the growth of a collective is um, a problem. I've been thinking a lot about um, Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift, which um, uh, he was a teaching assistant uh, who taught a course when I was a freshman in college. And, but the books had this resurgence and this idea of gift giving as a sort of economic model as opposed to, um, you know, commoditizing everything. Mm. I've been reading Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, and there's a wonderful um, short chapter about wild strawberries and um, the role of these um, strawberries, you know, picking them, uh, giving them to her father for Father's Day, um, her connection to nature, and it's all woven together. And she talks about the difference between, um, you know, a pair of socks that her mother knits her and gives to her versus one she might buy at Walmart. And even if they might look identical, they create a completely different sense of feeling. And in this book, um, that you mentioned that we just produced, um, there is a chapter on economic theory and there's an example um, that Will Evison and Sam Bickersteth, the authors use, a baby stroller. And they talk about, you know, if you produced a really beautifully well-constructed, gorgeous um, baby stroller and a family went out and purchased it and they raised their, their three kids and then they gave it away to, you know, their sister-in-law or whomever. And um, they raised their family and then they gave it away to somebody else. And as it sort of moved through these five families, all these kids suddenly have a bond and these families have a bond. And this well-made baby stroller that could, could withstand going through these five families has created, has woven a fabric of, of connectedness. And yet that's an absolute failure from the perspective of gross domestic product that um, it would be much, much better if you built a really poorly constructed baby stroller that just barely made it through uh, the last child in the family and then had to be thrown out into a landfill and each other family bought their own and never had those connections. And so there is something broken in the way we think about economics if we're gauging our success based on something like GDP instead of the kinds of activities and sharing and collective action and, and forming these bonds of, of gift giving, right. sharing, working together towards a collective, all things that we actually know make us happy. And so right. if we're trying to maximize right. happiness and well being as opposed to maximize, you know, producing lots of goods and selling them, um, then we're measuring some of the wrong things. And you have actually a chapter on that in this book. And there is a growing movement. So France has uh, first Bhutan created its uh, gross national happiness uh, um, way of uh, looking at things and, and looking at its economy. And then France has, but also um, Iceland, Scotland and um, New Zealand have created what they call well-being economies. And so these are smaller countries, not France, but the others. But we're beginning to see the emergence of these alternative economic ideas that say we should really measure what matters. You know, it's interesting on the, the collective financing, your example about, uh, because in, in, in my family, there are many things that have been received from older mothers and that are passed on to younger mothers. Uh, we see, you know, uh, once they've no longer been needed. Um, but I had an experience of being uh, in Bhutan, in the Him high in the Himalayas, in a, in a real, they have really wonderful, fairly big houses there. And uh, the houses are built, um, they have a, the forests in Bhutan are protected, but every village has its own um, common forest that is managed for the common goods. And everybody has a certain amount of cutting rights. 
but not too much so that it's sustainable. And when it comes time to build your house, you cut the poles, you take them on yaks, and then you hire one master carpenter and everybody does like a barn building. So all your friends and relatives and the people in the community come together and build a house. And people live very, very comfortably. And uh, so I was sitting in one of those houses with a family having extended family, many generations having a meal. And I asked them, is there any hunger here? And they said, what a silly question. Of course not. You know, we grow more than enough and raise and we have yaks and yak cheese and blah, blah, blah. And then about 20 minutes later, one of them said, but we have a sister who got married to a guy and went to the city and they had to buy their apartment and they can't keep up with the mortgage. And so they to pay the mortgage, they can't buy food. So we send them down food. And I all of a sudden realized that we, we have done by the financialization of the world, we have substituted the bounty that comes from community. So when all these people, when you build your house out of the wood, the wood from the surrounding land and is built by volunteer labor and you have no mortgage, you have an entirely different financial future than if you have to buy something that was built by other people um, and take on a mortgage. Uh, so the de-financialization of part of our lives actually can lead to much more freedom and happiness if we do it in the right way. I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, systems would get very complex and the one that you're describing in Bhutan is obviously a, a simpler one, which is right. uh, very appealing in many ways, maybe would be hard to overlay onto a, you know, American society. But I think I think the core point of um, uh, there's so much to be gained from collective action and from sharing and from gift giving and um, from the sort of decommoditization of, of things, but also the fact that we've been fed a bill of goods about what makes us happy. And so, you know, that we actually know what makes us happy and it's not buying more and more stuff. Um, it's it's all the things that you're talking about. It's taking care of each other. It's working together towards a collective, working towards something greater than one's self that you care about. Um, and so I think you're right. It's it, in a lot of ways, it's about metrics and it, it's getting pretty clear that we're measuring some of the wrong things um, and that you know, we can optimize what we choose to optimize. But if, if we have a system that's all about optimizing capital flows, then that's, it shouldn't be a surprise that that doesn't necessarily make us happy. Right, exactly. Um, we have a question that I actually think is uh, related to uh, where we were discussing earlier. It says, I'm a doctor working in the UK, and I'd like to ask, how would it be best to raise the general public awareness of the links between deforestation, the risk of future pandemics, the agricultural industry going along with the risk of meat eating, etc. Um, so how do you put all these pieces together? Um, so let's start with that and then build from that piece towards the pandemic that we're facing now, which is clearly an issue of when the links, when we over exceed our bounds. Yeah, I mean, so that sounds like a question that's about how do we raise awareness about the connections between um, environmental change, environmental degradation and health with the example of deforestation, but you could put you know, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, global pollution, any manner of other large scale anthropogenic drivers in, in as a placeholder for that. Um, and it's a question that we're really kind of grappling with as the Planetary Health Alliance right now. We've just been formulating our sort of um, PHA 2.0 um, as we go forward with um, new funding for the next three or four years. And um, one of the changes that we've been making in what we're doing as an organization is to uh, heavily emphasize the need for what we call sort of mainstreaming planetary health. How do we um, raise awareness um, among the general public? And we don't have the answers. We're not super well versed and we're open to suggestions. Um, we're doing a, a, several different things. One thing we've done, um, given that this is a UK physician, is to create something called the Clinicians for Planetary Health um, Network which is a global network of nurses and doctors and midwives and traditional healers who, when you think about it, touch almost every single person 
on earth and they touch them in a way that's independent of politics or religion and they're some of the most trusted uh, messengers in the world. Nurses, for example, have been the most trusted messengers in the United States for 17 years in a row. And they're, I think, the first or second most trusted messengers globally. And so we're trying to um, get this network of clinicians to begin um, communicating that there are a lot of things that we can do as individuals that are very good for our own personal health, that are also very good for planetary health and therefore the health of other people and future generations. And those are things like vegetable source diets, like uh, muscle powered locomotion. So walking and biking um, to work, like advocating for green spaces in the places where you live, which are good for, for mental health and social health, um, like advocating for clean power sources for your uh, communities. And so there are things like that, which are, um, have that overlap. And so we're starting to try to design patient facing materials to help those clinicians play a role in getting the message out. But I think that there's a role to be played by um, our storytellers, by our artists. Um, uh, there's more to do with um, the use of uh, media. Um, it's one of the reasons we wrote this book that you're talking about was to try to get the message out. We've just published a whole anthology of case studies, which are freely um, downloadable, which we call a sort of an anthology of solutions. They're examples of solutions from around the world um, in planetary health that people can access at the Planetary Health Alliance website. So we're, we're trying lots of different things. We're also going to have our first big online annual conference. We sponsor an annual conference every year, but this year it will be online and we're trying to find ways to bring more people into um, the community that way. But um, as I say, we're, we're just getting our feet wet in this area. So we welcome suggestions from anybody. And now let's go to the issue of the COVID-19. Um, clearly that came from a human nature interface. Um, it, it, has that been a teachable moment or is it too fraught with its own emotion to make it a hard one to use? No, I think it's a teachable moment. Um, and we've actually seen a lot of um, press around um, that dimension of uh, the pandemic that um, this is a manifestation of a broken relationship with nature. And we've seen, you know, this kind of series of alarm bells ringing for the last few years. It, it's not just the pandemic. I mean, it was the hurricane season in the Caribbean with Irma and Maria, and, you know, that just sort of wiped out uh, whole nations in the Caribbean with huge costs. And then it was the fire season in California, and we'd never seen anything like it. But then there was the fire season in the Amazon and Siberia and then Australia. Um, there was the drought and conflict in the Sub-Sahel, followed by the worst locust outbreak in 70 years in East Africa, all of which are, you know, really significantly threatening livelihoods and lives. And this is sort of the latest in a kind of um, progression of um, closely spaced uh, warning bells that we're hearing about our broken relationship with the natural world. And so. Um, you know, I think the pandemic is clearly a, a planetary health um, problem. I think there are also enormous opportunities. I mean, what's interesting is to go beyond, yes, there's this mechanism where a virus that has a bat host, which probably was in an intermediate host, maybe in a pangolin, uh, went through a mutation and jumped to the human population. And, and here we are today. Um, and yes, that's a manifestation of our interactions with wildlife. And we've seen, you know, about 60% of emerging infectious diseases over the last 50 years have been from those kinds of interactions. So this is not a new phenomenon. Um, but what's also interesting is to think about what happened next, right? There's this, mm -hmm. there's this national discourse on the value of science. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen all this mistrust and miscommunication about science, which has really slowed us down from being effective in this country in addressing uh, the pandemic. We've seen similar sort of uh, populist governments in um, Brazil and other places where the same skepticism of science has really hampered our ability to deal with the problem, which looks a lot like how we're trying to address climate change, right? There, there are a lot of similarities. There's also this enormous opportunity, which I think is the, the more exciting part, right? Which is 
suddenly in the space of a few weeks, we saw almost every single person on the planet completely change their behavior in collective action to address an existential threat to their survival. And that's precisely what we need to do in, in planetary health, right? We need widespread global behavior change to address an existential threat to our survival. There's also a ton of opportunity um, when we think about what our response to this has been economically that you know, countries like our own and uh, in Europe um, and many others are launching these enormous stimulus packages to try to revive um, economies that are tipping into serious depressions. And um, there are trillions of dollars of investment that are being contemplated. And it seems to me that, you know, as a citizenry, we should be demanding that our tax dollars not go towards propping up an old broken system that's destroying the biosphere and threatening our survival, but in fact be investing in new sort of green infrastructure towards this great transition and changing how we do what we do. So there's this huge investment opportunity, both in our stimulus packages and assistance packages to require that that money be spent in building something um, much more hopeful for uh, the trajectory of people and uh, life on earth. That's really interesting. And you know, so you, you know, it's for some people difficult, for some people extremely painful, for some just inconvenient. But we have tolerated um, an extraordinary shift we have in, in terms of human behavior. And um, and what that tells us is that the range of behaviors that we can tolerate is much greater than we had previously said it was, the range and shift in behaviors. And so just think about the amount of people now who increase number of people who are biking or walking versus driving and all, all those things. That, um, uh, so yes, the fruits of out of it, this tells us the behavior change is possible, behavior change for the common good. The other thing is, we're all told that we're not wearing a mask for yourself, you're wearing a mask for everybody else. So um, there's a lot of resistance to these messages, but but yeah, the seeds of the transformation, the transformation is happening now. You know, it's interesting because also the issue of race has been upon us for a very, very long since we invented the idea of race. The issue of race has been upon us and certainly since the civil rights movement. But it's interesting that at exactly the same time the murder of George Floyd that we all saw was it feels like it's a tipping point that put the issue of anti-racism on the table in a bigger way than it had been before. And so um, the forces of the old order and what may be the great transition have come to the fore now. And maybe the fact that there, there's more confrontation it, but maybe the fact that they're not hidden anymore, that everything's seen is, is good. I think that's, I think that's right. Um, I guess a couple of things that I'd want to say. One is that there's been a um, tendency among a small kind of um, group within the environmental community to almost celebrate um, the pandemic as we see um, our sort of ecological footprint being reduced. And, um, you know, people have talked about sort of mother nature having a temper tantrum. And I think that's incredibly sort of dangerous language. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not um, in any way the message that I'm trying to communicate. I think the pandemic is a tragedy and um, we're seeing, you know, just extraordinary suffering in, in lives and livelihoods lost all over the world. Um, but I do think it's important to look at it and learn from it despite all of that suffering. And that's to the points that you just made that um, we are seeing this capacity for behavior change. We are seeing capacity for altruistic um, right. behavior, which is extraordinarily important for us to recognize and acknowledge we are capable of that. And that we do see opportunities for these investments to take us to, um, to a different place. And on the topic of racism, I mean, for a while, I sort of thought these were two kind of independent strains that were coming together. And the more I think about it, 
they, they come together around this concept of regeneration, which is one I know that you think a lot about. Um, but you know, for a long time, we've talked about sustainability and the, and the term sustainability has never actually resonated very much for me, partly because I've never quite been able to know exactly what it meant um, because it's used to mean so many different things by different communities. Um, but I also, there's something about it that's just fundamentally unexciting to me as a word. Um, you know, I don't want to sustain the status quo. The status quo is very problematic. And um, so we have a lot of ground to make up. We need to regenerate our biosphere. And it turns out what we're waking up to right now is that we very urgently and dramatically need to regenerate um, our relationships with each other. Um, and that those things actually are connected. Um, there's a way in which I think we've been living on earth that is fundamentally uh, oppressive. And one of the core messages of planetary health is a message of um, justice and equity that when you look at who um, gets the benefits of transforming our natural systems, whether it's the fossil fuel industry and the climate system or deforestation in Indonesia or any other you know, pollution problem that you look at. If you look at who gets the benefits, because always somebody is benefiting or they wouldn't be doing it in the first place, and who bears the burden um, you know, it's the wealthiest people in the wealthiest parts of the world who tend to reap the benefits. And it's the poorest people in the poorest parts of the world and future generations, and particularly indigenous people and people of color who tend to bear the greatest burden. And there's something just deeply unfair, right, about that distribution of benefits and costs. And so I think, you know, planetary health actually cannot be successful and the great transition cannot occur without also addressing those sort of systematic inequities in you know who reaps the benefits and 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 pays the costs uh, of our activities you know what i'm just going to leave a minute just to absorb that because that is such a fundamental thought that the inequitable distribution of benefits and burdens is at the source of all this, at the source of human health and planetary health. On the subject of sustainability, we have a question from a student at Ohio State University who is a rising senior focusing on real estate and urban development that seeks to really learn more about sustainability and environmentalism and says, but it may get a page or a chapter in a textbook, but it's not really integrated into the teaching of urban planning or, or real estate. How can we as a society and myself as a student help to better un enforce holistic teaching of planetary health and environmentalism in our nation's universities? And with a focus, this question, that's a general question, but then also one on real estate and urban planning. So why don't you answer the general one and I'll answer the real estate and urban planning part of it. I was going to say, you're, you're much more qualified to answer that question than I am. But um, I mean, for one, I would say there's a whole chapter uh, in this book about urban design um, and planetary health, um, how we design the world's cities is one of the single most important levers for whether we can achieve the great transition. Um, we know that already the majority of people on the planet live in cities. We know that that percentage is gonna rise dramatically over the next 50 years. Um, we know that in places like Africa, um, there's gonna be a massive increase in uh, population and therefore in design and, and growth of cities. Um, and that if we could figure out how to design those cities to optimize mental and physical health of the inhabitants and minimize the ecological footprint of inhabitants, we could go a long way towards bringing humanity back into balance with our natural systems. And as you know, Jonathan, I mean, there's a ton that we know about how to do that. And so it's outrageous that you can go to a school of architecture or urban design and not um, 
get exposed to at least a full course on this topic, if not, you know, a whole sort of degree program in it, because it's one of the pivotal um, central issues of whether society is going to be able to make the transition that it needs to make. And so I would invite this student to get in touch with us. I think what we really need is to start building sub communities within planetary health. So we need a community of architects and urban planners that identifies around planetary health and is helping to reform curriculum and to change the status quo, um, just like we do in food systems and energy systems and uh, waste management and a million other areas. But I'm curious to hear your response to, to the question as well. So I'm going to say something that's probably politically incorrect, but I'm going to say it anyway. And that is in my experience with universities, um, usually the students are way ahead of the faculty. And um, so, for example, there was a movement that was started by a friend of mine about 10 years ago called Architecture 2030, which set a goal that all architecture would be in effect carbon neutral by 2030 and that schools would teach it. And uh, at the time when the movement started, there were almost no professors who knew how to teach it or were particularly interested in it. There were a small percentage of professors of architecture were interested in teaching it. They were interested in other things. And it was the students who picked up the Architecture 2030 movement and then demanded of their schools that either they hire the professors who could teach it or that their professors figure out how to teach it. And now, um, the architecture 2030 commitment and goals is really embedded in most architecture schools around the country. So uh, number one, what's interesting is we're seeing this. So Sophie, the questioner, your, your voice, you are not alone. And your generation, many, many people who are involved in urban studies and real estate have the same desire. And so what we've seen from the architecture 2030 example is if you work together, so if the real estate clubs, which I found most many schools really with have a real estate program have, uh, if they all begin doing self teaching and demanding this um, academically, uh, you can help shift what's taught. The second thing is that the things you need to know are so broad. Um, you know, typically one's undergraduate as you pursue it and you're saying now you're becoming a, a, a senior, you're becoming narrowed towards a specialty. Um, and this requires expansion. So beyond just what you're going to learn in school, and I say this to actually everybody, you know, we need to learn from anthropology and we need to learn from economics and we need, and, and uh, in behavioral economics. And uh, there's so much that's emerging now about how we shift behaviors and, and, uh, in psychology and social psychology and, and and it can go on and as Sam keeps referring and very very important we know the indigenous peoples have really figured a lot of this out a long time ago just as a very simple example when Sam referred to a book braiding sweetgrass and in it it describes something called the three sisters which are um, that what happens when you grow corn beans and squash together they both naturally self fertilize each other they add the appropriate nutrients to the soil, but they also, if you eat them, provide a complete protein. So there it is with indigenous knowledge, a scientific knowledge about a very holistic way for us to function. So what I encourage you is you're probably not going to get it in, uh, in any one course. You have to create the course for yourself and uh, create it with, you know, create a club, create a study group, create it with friends. Um, I hope that's helpful. And um, I, I wrote a book called The Well-Tempered City that tries to integrate all these things. So that might be a useful guide too. One other thing I will add to, to that, which was really eloquent, um, is that the Planetary Health Alliance does have a program called the Planetary Health Alliance um, Campus Ambassadors. And mm -hmm. um, we're uh, sponsoring ambassadors all over the world now on different campuses. And we would love to have a campus ambassador at 
an architecture, urban design school. And what those ambassadors do is actually to network with other students, to build um, journal clubs, to put pressure on the university for curriculum reform. And they connect with each other all over the world to build community. In fact, they just a couple of weeks ago published a paper in Lancet Planetary Health about um, the work that they're doing. And so they're a very dynamic, energetic force, and it gives you a sense of um, sort of collegiality and company in pursuing things that can be a little bit lonely on campuses that don't already uh, focus on these questions. So can you, um, uh, how would you, for anybody on here who wants to join such an, a, a network, what do, what do they, who do they write? What do they do? They should come to the Planetary Health Alliance website, um, which is very straightforward. It's www.planetaryhealthalliance.org. Um, and um, there's an email address there, so they can um, send, a, send us a message. They can sign up for our newsletter. Um, and there's also going to be applications opening up actually this fall uh, for our next round of campus ambassadors. So if that's of interest, they can see um, how to apply for the, for the ambassadorship. Um, wonderful, what a great opportunity. That's gonna be a fantastic network to be a member of. We have another question, this one from a public health student in India. Um, inspired by the previous question, uh, the one we just heard, since being out in the White Mountains as your younger self served as the impetus for you to be drawn to the natural world, should the process of understanding and reconnecting with nature be part of the curriculum starting in primary school and going forward? Yes. Um, I think that uh, I think that every opportunity we have to get kids out in nature is a is a great one um, to support. I think there's good evidence. That's not just a, a an ideological statement. Um, but there's good evidence that um, kids learn better, they retain better, their mental health is better uh, when they're active um, and outdoors. Now. Um, that's also, you know, there's some issues of privilege around around that statement because there are um, there are communities where you know getting outside um, can actually be dangerous, um, and we've confronted this with some of our communities, even in um, the boroughs in New York City, where you've got Hispanic communities where going out into the parks means being exposed to you know dangerous levels of particulate matter and. Um, particularly for kids with any kind of respiratory disease. And so um, it's easy to say, as somebody who was exposed to the White Mountains of New Hampshire, yeah, get out in nature. But um, that actually also means a commitment at the community level of keeping nature clean enough so that um, it's not a health hazard for kids. And if you're in India, um, you know well that um, many of the biggest cities in India um, going out and playing outdoors is actually probably not very good for you. And so um, the first thing you need to do is is get the air cleaned up and um, then uh, get kids out uh, in natural settings. But I do think that um, I do think that that basic connection to um, being outdoors in natural settings has really been well studied as um, uh, having a lot of impact both on psychological well-being and also on um, cognitive function, and um, it's pretty incontrovertible. So interestingly, building on that, in so America's cities experienced an extraordinary decline starting in the 70s through the 80s and the 90s, and only began to come back in the late 80s and 90s, and then really have zoomed back and we've seen enormous reurbanization in the 2000s. The first thing that began to bring our cities back was the people who were remaining in these sparsely settled and more abandoned neighborhoods started taking over vacant lots and turning them into gardens. And the gardens were not only places of their own healing and their growing of food, but they were these places of collective action. They, were, they, were, they all came together and uh, in all different flavors. So in the Hispanics, they built these little casitas where they'd hang out and play card games in their gardens. and. Um, many other manifestations. So um, uh, that has been an aspect of it. So regenerating the land and regenerating people, there's a kind of um, commonality. It's interesting, the force of regeneration has many manifestations, but in all of its manifestations, 
it regenerates. I think that's right. And that's that's why these two connect questions are connected. I mean, there's so much that we know about urban design. And if you create um, green spaces and you clean them up, um, then you actually create not only um, mental health and physical health improvements for individuals, but you build a social fabric of where people can come together. In fact, one of our case studies in the anthology is about the wastewater treatment facility in, in Santiago del Chile, the biggest city in Chile. And um, by creating a biofactory, which is now a zero carbon um, biofactory that's um, processing all of the sewage and solid waste for the entire city. And it's also producing energy, fresh water, and nitrogen and phosphorus for surrounding farms. And it's cleaned up the river that used to receive you know, all the sewage, 98% of the sewage was untreated for the city. Mm. Now they have a clean water and a river that's being, you know, regenerated and green space around it. And the river doesn't stink and people are coming together there as a you know, place for recreation and social connection. So these things do all tie together, which is kind of the core theme of planetary health. Great. Um, yeah, just to, by, by the way, to tie this to economics, it costs in you know, those kind of sewer treatment plants about a hundred dollars a ton to remove the nitrogen and phosphorus, and you can sell them for four hundred dollars a ton to um, fertilizer manufacturers. And so, they the the sewage treatment plant is actually a plant. It functions like a plant. It grows things. It grows things well. Um, another student asks, um, what opportunities are there for high school students to get involved with the Planetary Health Alliance? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about as somebody whose daughters are just getting into high school. Um, and I think that there's an enormous opportunity to develop sort of K through 12 educational materials around planetary health. It's in some ways, I think even more intuitive for kids before they get to college and kind of get uh, indoctrinated in a very disciplinary siloed way of thinking about the sciences that um, everything is sort of connected. And um, I think it would be really wonderful to um, do more with K through 12 um, curriculum in the sciences. And we're starting to explore that. So um, I guess what I would say is reach out to us, um, uh, you know, let us know your ideas. Um, right now, um, there's not a whole sort of plethora of opportunities, but um, maybe we need high school um, campus ambassadors, and maybe we need to um, think about how we can get some um, more senior students in high school to really help us uh, organize and pave the way for curriculum development. We're also in conversation with the Harvard Ed School, which has done some interesting work around, actually with us, around um, developing planetary health curriculum. Uh, and so that's an area we want to grow. Um, and we'd, we'd really welcome your participation. So get in touch uh, and we can try to figure out um, how to build something. So, and you mentioned uh, to me, talk about what's going on with, at the other end of the spectrum, in Berlin. Uh, what's going on in Germany related to doctor's training? It's really, I mean, it's, it's kind of extraordinary, actually, when you think that the term planetary health really didn't even come into public parlance until the release of the commission report I told you about in 2015. So here we are, you know, five years later, and there are journals of planetary health that have proliferated, there are degree programs, um, there are professorships, um, and uh, a huge amount of research being done. And now what we're seeing is um, more and more sort of institutional growth. So um, we're seeing regional hubs, which is very, very exciting. So um, in the Caribbean, there's a very active regional hub taking shape, um, as well as in Singapore and the South Pacific, um, in East Africa, West Africa, Northern Europe. And so we're seeing these sort of um, sort of groups that are springing up and recreating planetary health in their own image, but but connecting with each other. Um, and then we're seeing efforts like the one Jonathan's talking about in Germany, where the government has said that every medical school in Germany needs to be able to teach core competencies in planetary health. And in fact, we have a whole group um, through the Alliance that's organizing and, and developing those core competencies. In Brazil, there's a huge amount going on with planetary health through University of Sao Paulo and other groups. And um, 
They've developed a whole course in planetary health in Portuguese, which we're now translating into English, but 3,000 people signed up for that course online. There's another course actually in Germany that's been developed in Berlin. So um, around the world, we're seeing different efforts, um, uh, but more and more activity as this community grows and, and kind of comes together. Great. You know, I'm going to end with a quote from your, that you and Howard Frumpkin wrote in your book. You wrote, we know much of what we need to do. We need to get on with it to drive the great transition towards planetary, planetary health. So thank you, Sam, today for inspiring us and giving us some ideas for what we all need to do together. And again, I recommend that anybody on this who uh, who's listening to this, uh, who wishes to get more involved, uh, go to the Planetary Health Alliance and you will find many, many different ways to get involved with the Alliance itself. And also check out the many extraordinary institutions that are members of the Alliance and there might be something there for you too. We thank you all for joining us today. Please keep checking the GarrisonInstitute.org website for updated listings of future sessions and to view this recording which will get posted shortly and if you like to please share it with others our next conversation will be on thursday august 13th a week from today with paul hawken and it will continue the conversation about regeneration um, again these sessions are offered for free of charge and if you'd like to support our programming please consider making a donation at the garrison institute.org thank you very much Thank you, audience, and thank you, Sam. All right, thank you so much. Lovely to be with you. You too.